Okay, so today we are going to discuss uh, another attack detection scheme which is using principle component analysis. Okay, and here is the setting that I want you to think about. So So consider the following situation. Suppose that this particular room has two sensors, okay? There's one temperature sensor here, and suppose that there is another temperature sensor on the other side of the room. Now, I want to plot, so my state, which is the temperature of the room, Xt is an R2, right? Because I have two temperature sensors in the same room. What do you expect the Xt to look like? So this is your xt1 and this is your xt2 and I'm going to plot it well let me call it x1 and x2 because I'm not going to plot it only for one time but I'm going to plot it for like the entire duration so every one minute I'm measuring the temperature x1 temperature of the first point and then temperature of the second point okay so x1 and x2 what do you expect the temperature graph to look like over long periods of time. So you expect, let, let's say this is my 70, 75, 65. So we kind of expect our points to look something like this. Right, so this is my 65, 70, 75, right? So all of we, all of us understand that over long periods of time, this is what I'm expecting to see uh, uh, in, my, in my data set. So what principal component analysis does is it tries to identify this plane on which the data lies, okay? Now, of course, the plane, so if you, if you look at it closely, the two temperature sensors will have some noise because of which they will not be exactly along the same, it will not be exactly along the line, but it will be very close to the line, okay? And that's an indication that, you know, the two temperatures are kind of the same. Now, suppose you detect a data point which looks like this. So one sensor says it's 65, the other says it's 75. Then we know that something is wrong, okay? And that's perhaps due to a fault or perhaps due to an attack. So further investigations would be needed. Okay, so this is the attack detection strategy that we will be discussing today. And that comes from principal component analysis. This is a mathematical technique in linear algebra, which tells you the, the hyperplane or the plane on which most of the data resides. Or all the data is close to that plane. So we, are, we want to identify the plane. So here is the general recipe for identifying the plane. Uh, I first have to get the entire data set around the origin. So I have to subtract the mean of the data set. So this gets transformed to a data that looks something like this. Okay, so I'm going to subtract the mean of the data. So now the entire data set gets translated around the, the, the zero mean. And then I'm going to apply a transformation, which is rotation. So this is, this is translation by subtracting mean. And then I have rotation. by matrix multiplication. And I will tell you how to compute that matrix from which you, with which you need to multiply. But then the data set will look something like this. And when you have the spoof data, which will be here, then that data, oh, I, I already used X. I don't want to call it X, maybe I should call it this is the spoof data. So that spoof data would appear here. 
and then it would appear here after the rotation is complete. Okay, so most of the data set will be along the along certain axis after the rotation and the data set that is not along that axis which has a positive value along some other axis or positive or negative value along some other axis then it means that something has gone wrong and if you consistently see this data that's along that's positive or negative along some other axis then uh, you can raise an alarm and then try and figure out what exactly has gone wrong. Any questions with the general methodology? Have any of you done PCA before, principal component analysis before? No? Okay, good. So this is the new stuff for most of you. So the question is, how do you translate by subtracting mean? I guess all of you understand how this would be done, but we will cover it. But the key in principal component analysis is trying to identify what is this matrix with which you need to multiply the data set by. So let's try to uh, study the theory. I'm going to erase everything on the board. Now the benefit of this PCA approach is after you have done the data processing for the unattacked case, which is you know you, you ran the system when there was no attack and you computed the mean and you've computed the matrix, then that's it. Then after that, the attack detection is as easy as just matrix multiplication, right? So, so that's the benefit. It's very, very fast and when I was, remember last time I was discussing about the power systems example where you have like a thousand dimensional state. So imagine if you have to multiply a thousand cross thousand matrix with a, with a thousand dimensional vector, it's not really a complicated, uh, not a complicated, uh, 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 what is that, matrix multiplication, which means that, um, you can, in real time, or near real time, you can detect an attack, even with very high dimensional data set. Okay, so here is my problem. I have x1, x2, xt. These are all in Rn, and think of n to be 1000. Okay, some very high dimensional space. And this is the state of the system that you are observing. How do I compute the mean? This is my mean, which is also in Rn. I'm going to assume that this is all unattacked situation, uh, un unattacked. So I have a data set, clean data set from unattacked situation, and I have lots of data set. <coughs> so T should be greater than equal to, I'm going to put a random number, 5n, but you, you understand, like it has to be, t has to be much larger than the value of n. The more the merrier, so t has to be greater than 10n or 15n, but at the very least, you want t to be greater than 5n. Okay, so you have a clean data set, you computed the mean, now you define the centered variable, centered variable, which is yt, which is xt minus mu. And then you define a matrix y, which is y1 transpose, y2 transpose, y capital T transpose. So this is a matrix and this matrix is an RT cross T cross N.
Okay, so we have translated the random variable by the mean mu. So now all of this is mean zero, random variable, random vectors. Okay, so I have formed a matrix out of these random vectors that I have collected from the unattacked situation. Okay, now I need to figure out the rotation matrix. Okay, that's my goal. So I'm going to talk about singular value decomposition. And the singular value decomposition says that I can decompose that matrix Y into U sigma V transpose, where U is eigenvectors of Y Y transpose V eigenvectors of y transpose y and sigma i i or sigma is diagonal matrix diagonal where sigma i i square root of lambda i of y transpose y, which is the same as square root of lambda i y y transpose. This is in R T cross T. This is in R N cross N. Okay, I'll let you guys write it while I erase the board on this side. Lambda is the eigenvalue of this matrix Y transpose Y or Y Y transpose. I just want to give you an example. So if I have a matrix 4, 8, 11, 7, 14, minus 2, this can be given by 3, matrix here. So let me say V transpose and V is given by 1 by 3 you don't have to copy this example but I'm I want to use this example to demonstrate certain things.
so this is my u matrix this is my sigma matrix and this is my v matrix okay well i guess everyone is writing <laughs> okay don't need to write this okay so questions are the columns of u orthogonal to each other are the columns of u orthogonal to each other Okay, so columns of U are orthogonal to each other. Why are they orthogonal to each other? Well, yeah. Why is their inner product? Why, why, why do they have zero inner product? Sorry. No. No. No, that's exactly what he was saying. Uh, what kind of matrix is this? Y, Y transpose. Positive semi-definite matrix, right? So because it's a symmetric matrix, the eigenvectors of symmetric matrices are orthogonal to each other, right? So eigenvectors of symmetric matrices are orthogonal to each other. So that's why the columns of U are orthogonal to each other. What about columns of V? Once again, this is a symmetric matrix. Because you have a symmetric matrix, Y transpose Y, the eigenvectors of Y transpose Y are also orthogonal to each other. Because of which the columns of V are orthogonal to each other. Okay, now sigma, it's a diagonal matrix, but it's actually a rectangular matrix. It's not a, it's not a, a symmetric matrix. So if you look at sigma here, you have diagonal entries that are positive in this case, and then off diagonal entries are all zero, okay? And that's by design because sigma is actually a diagonal matrix. And it turns out that sigma ii, which is, the, which is this particular um, vector, sigma 1, 1, that would be the largest eigenvalue of y transpose y. And then the sigma 2, 2 would be the second largest eigenvalue of y transpose y. And if you had sigma 3, 3 and sigma 4, 4 and sigma 5, 5, all of them would be the third largest eigenvalue, fourth largest eigenvalue, fifth largest eigenvalue with a square root, okay? So it's very easy, given a matrix Y, it's very easy, well, well it's still going to take some time for MATLAB to compute these uh, U sigma and V but there is a simple command, SVD, in MATLAB or in Python or in R, which you can run on Y. So SVD of Y, and you will get as output U, Sigma, and V as output, okay? So it's very simple command in MATLAB and in all the softwares, other programming softwares where you can get the U, V, and Sigma very easily. So let me erase this. Yes. Positive, U is not positive semi-definite. Eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix, U is eigenvectors of Y, Y transpose. This is a symmetric matrix, so eigenvectors have to be orthogonal to each other. Okay? And so eigenvectors are each column of U, they are eigenvectors of Y, Y transpose. Y, Y transpose is positive definite matrix. So U is the eigenvector. It's not positive definite, it's positive semi-definite. That's right. That's right. Okay. Any other question?
Okay. So you you will also notice that U is a uh, uh, what is known as unitary matrix, which means that each of the columns, their eigen, their uh, norm is equal to one. So the norm of this column is one. Norm of this column is one. Norm of this column, this column, and this column, they are all one. Okay, so they are all unit vectors. Each of these are unit vectors. Okay. In what follows, I am going to call this vector v1, this vector v2, this vector v3, and so on. Okay, so you will have like n number of vectors. And the same thing goes for u as well. Okay. So, perfect. So now I have y equals to u sigma v transpose. Oh, the other thing you would have noticed in sigma is, remember that sigma 1, 1 is the largest eigenvalue square root. Sigma 2, 2 is the second largest eigenvalue square root. So you can actually sigma nn. So I have this ordering on the what is known as singular values. These are known as singular values of y. Okay, so here is what happens. My sigma is arranged in a, in a non-decreasing fashion, non-increasing fashion. So suppose you have n equals to 1000. This is what you will observe in your data set, assuming that they all lie in a plane. This will be, say, 10,000. This will be 100. This will be 57 then some 10, 5, 0 0.1, 0 0.006, 0 0.00007, blah, blah, blah. What do you notice? This is what the singular values are going to look like. And what we notice is some singular values are large, okay, but at some point of time, The singular values are really small, okay? It will go below certain threshold, whatever threshold you want to set. Okay, what does this actually mean? So how many singular values do I have here? One, two, three, four, five, six. So I have six singular values that are greater than the threshold that I have set. So let's say in my mind, the threshold is 0 0.01. That's my threshold. So I have six singular values that are above the threshold. And the rest of the singular values, remember, n equals to 1,000. So I have like six uh, principal components. And then others are not so principal components, OK? So because they are below the threshold, the singular values of those are below the threshold. Now what are these six principal components? So let me draw the, let me tell you the final conclusion, which requires a little bit of thinking. So, but, but it is typically covered whenever you take a class on singular value decomposition, it will be covered why this is the case. But it turns out that your yi would be, no, y t would be so y t transpose v1. Remember, v, v is v1, v2, v3, 
and so on, Vn. So yt transpose V1 is going to be large number. I, I shouldn't say large. Let's say the absolute value is going to be large. And yt transpose V6, the absolute value is going to be large. So these are large values. Typically, these values would range within these, these values. Like if you look at the inner product, they would look similar to these values. Not exactly the same, but similar. However, if you look at yt transpose v7 or yt transpose v8 and so on, these are going to be small values. So now, th these are all unattacked si systems. So from the unattacked system, I subtracted the mean. I got yt. So xt was the original state. I subtracted the mean mu. Then I got yt. Then I did the singular value decomposition. I found out this matrix V, capital V. Uh, we know that V1, V2, V3, all of these are orthogonal vectors. And they are also unit norm vectors. I looked at yt transpose v1, turns out the value would be like 9700, okay? Then I look at yt transpose v2, that will be 150. Then I looked at yt transpose v3, that is somewhere close to 60 or 65, okay? And so on and so forth. Now I looked at yt transpose v7, turns out it is equal to 0 0.007. Okay, and same thing for V8 and so on and so forth. Now what exactly are these, these vectors V1 and V6 in the original figure? So remember I had drawn this figure of X1 and X2. So going back to that figure, this is my V1 and this is my v2. So in that figure, because we only had two states, temperature of sensor one and temperature of sensor two, I only have two, n was equal to two, so I only have v1 and v2, okay, that's it. There are only two components, principal, uh, well, not principal components. So two vectors, v1 and v2. v1 is along the line where all the data set lies. v2 is orthogonal to that particular line. And so what I'm going to expect is, if I look at xt minus mu transpose v1, this is going to be some large number, but xt minus mu transpose v2, it's going to be a small number. Okay, now how would you come up with an attack detection scheme? So now you have the offline data set, uh, which was unattacked case, you computed mu, and you have computed V1 and V2 and V3 and so on, all the way up to Vn. And now you are asked to come up with a production system that is going to detect whether an attack is happening on a large building where you have maybe a thousand temperature sensors sensing temperature from all over the place. 
what will you do? How will you come up with an attack detection scheme there? Right, so, so this is what is happening in real system. In real system, uh, so this is what is happening in the production system. You have your code. And within the code, you have the value mu, and you have the, let's say, vector v1 all the way up to vn. OK, so this is something you have from the offline data set. And the code is ingesting xt. So at every point of time, you are getting the reading for all the temperatures inside the building. That's xt. It's a vector. And I'm asking you to come up with a code which detects the attack and raises an alarm if there is an attack and not raise an alarm if there is no attack. So how would you, what exactly, how would you write that code based on all the theory that we have learned so far? Let's go back to the example, right? So I have a point here, and you know that this point doesn't seem to be the right point, OK? So it seems to be anomalous and perhaps due to an attack. If this is my, let's say, x5, what do you expect x5 minus mu transpose v1 to be and x5 minus mu transpose v2 to be? Yeah. x5 minus mu transpose v1 should be large. That is our expectation. Right. right. But if, uh, because it is, the system is attacked, then we are expecting something different than large. In the second case? Or in the first case? No, my question is for if attack happens, yes. both will change, right? Yeah. Both of them will change. Yeah, so we are not doing hypothesis testing here, OK? So we are just looking at linear algebra. I'll get back to the hypothesis testing part a little bit later. So here is what is happening. So what exactly is this x5 minus mu transpose v1? Well, this is your mu. And this is my x5 minus mu transpose v1. By the way, I did say that these could be large values, but they could also take small values if they are very close to the mean. Uh, so if y, yt's are, when you look at a thousand dimensional vector, typically those vectors will not be around the mean. But if they are, if it just turns out that they are close to the mean, they could take smaller values as well. Because if xt is equal to mu, then yt is equal to 0. So yt transpose v6 will be actually equal to 0. OK. so. Going back to this example, maybe this is not really a nice, uh, OK, I'm going to erase this part. And I'm going to zoom in to this particular figure. So I have this data points. This is my v1. This is my v2. This is my mu. This is my x5. And this distance is x5 minus mu transpose v1. And this distance x5 minus mu transpose v2. OK, now here is what I was saying. If this is your x1, remember that x1 is close to mu. So x1 minus mu transpose v1 is going to be small. OK, or this is your x2. Then x2 minus mu transpose v1 is going to be large value because it's far away from the mean. But if you look at v2, 
no matter whether you take x1 minus mu transpose v2, it's going to be small, x2 minus mu transpose v2, that's also going to be small because they are all along this line. They don't have any component along that direction. So what you are going to do is you will look at x5 minus mu transpose v2 and if it is larger than a threshold, then it means that you have an anomalous behavior from the system and it is perhaps due to an attack or it could be a sensor failure or it could be some, some problem with the system. So in your code, you are going to look at, remember you had six, six uh, singular values that were beyond, that were greater than threshold and rest of them were smaller than threshold. So what your code is going to check is xt minus mu transpose v, v7. xt minus mu transpose v8 and so on. And if any of these numbers are greater than a threshold, you are going to raise an alarm that looks something seems fishy, okay? And that's because one of the values are greater than the threshold. And from our knowledge, I know that all the data points should be along this hyperplane. So if I see a component in the orthogonal direction, then it means that something has gone wrong in the system. And the best way to compute all of these values is just to xt minus mu transpose v or alternatively v transpose xt minus mu. This is going to give you a bunch of numbers. So I'm going to ignore, ignore these numbers. These are the six uh, like be above the threshold six values, I'm going to ignore them, and I'm going to look at these numbers, which is seven to 1,000. I'm going to look at that part of the vector, and I'm going to check whether they are below a threshold or above a threshold. If they are above a threshold, something has gone wrong. If they are consistently above the threshold, then of course, uh, something has gone wrong. If it has just happened for one second, and then everything went back to normal, it may just be a gust of cold air or a gust of hot air at the time of measuring the temperature. So you can probably ignore that. And you said that we're taking the magnitude of this multiplication, right? Uh, you are looking at the magnitude of the multiplication, yes. Because, so this magnitude is going to be positive, and if you have, say, X7, This is minus V2, and this magnitude is going to be negative. So this is positive, X7 minus mu transpose V2, that's going to be negative. So certainly you want to look at the absolute value, not the actual magnitude. So, so the first six uh, principal components yes. have large... Uh, it could have large or it could have small, depending on how far it is from the mean. Okay. Yeah. So we are ignoring those because... Well, because the data is supposed to lie along those first six components. Does not apply to all the points? Uh, right. So as you can see, you don't expect the data to be in this direction or in this direction. Yeah. So that's 7 to 1,000. OK, so, so if I want to go over this particular example, so I'm going to erase this board. So this is summation of alpha i v i i goes from 1 to 6. This is summation of alpha i v i. i goes from 7 to 1000. OK? And so all the data set is supposed to lie along this line. And it could be a little bit above or below this line or this hyperplane. But it cannot be here. 
Okay, and that's what you are trying to check by looking at the threshold and absolute value of this, uh, these points in the matrix. <coughs> okay. So we talked about two different types of attack detection scheme. One was using hypothesis testing where we were talking a lot about distributions of random variables or conditional distributions of Markov chains, transition kernel of Markov chains. In this case, we didn't talk any, any of that stuff, okay? So what exactly are we checking in terms of statistics? What exactly are we checking in this particular analysis? deviations from the mean, uh, but I think the hypothesis test also used to check in some sense deviations from the mean. It's a bit more than that. It's a bit more than deviations from the mean, but you are going in the right direction. Yeah, I think uh, you are also close, <laughs> but not there yet. Okay, so every distribution is supposed to have a support. Okay, so there's something called a support of the distribution. So I have a probability density function, PDF, let's say F of X, and this X is in Rn. So I have a PDF, there is something called support of the distribution. Okay, support of the distribution, which is the set in which the, so the support of a distribution is the set in which the probability of, okay, uh, how should I say? So this is intersection of all subsets A such that probability of A is equal to one. Okay, that's known as the support of the function f, uh, of the probability distribution f. So for Gaussian random variable, what is the support? The support is entire Rn, okay, because the distribution is telling you that the variables are distributed over the entire Rn. What you're doing in PCA is trying to check whether the support of the distribution has changed or not due to an attack on the system. Okay, that's what this PCA is trying to detect. So like you were mentioning, uh, deviation from mean is like changing the support of the distribution itself. And the second thing, what, what did you say? You had something else, right? Yeah, deviation, right? So you're not checking for deviation with respect to mean, but you're checking for deviation with respect to support of the distribution itself. So in real terms, the support tells you that these are the values that I expect to see in my data set, okay? That's the support. And if I see a value which is outside of the support, then it means that something has gone wrong inside the system. So what you are checking for using PCA is how far you are from the support of the distribution according to which the random variables, which is the state, are distributed. So this is of course not, I mean, this is a little bit complicated stuff. So I don't expect you to understand right away. But if you go on and take courses in random processes and stochastic processes, you will understand what I'm talking about because there, uh, people generally talk about support of a distribution or support of a Markov chain. Okay. So in your case, that horizontal plane is the support. Right. So it's not just the horizontal plane, but this is basically your support. This is your support of the distribution. You re expect all the, no matter what the state is, as long as it is unattacked, 
you expect it to be within that set. Okay? So, how would adversary affect this? How can it make, you, make your code undetected? Well, it's going to pick a point here. Okay, so it's outside the support, but this PCA algorithm cannot detect that. Okay, so that's where adversary can fool you. That's a way for adversary to be able to fool you. But in order to get the temperature at this particular location, the adversary will have to change the temperature at all points in the building in a very specific fashion, which of course is a difficult thing to do. If you have a thousand sensors in the building and you are a single attacker, it's very difficult for you to go and change all the sensor readings. I mean, maybe it can be done, but most likely it's going to be difficult because you have to spoof a lot of sensors. So even though theoretically, mathematically, adversary can, can uh, generate a point XT here by spoofing the signals, uh, and your, your code will not be able to detect the attack. However, uh, it's very difficult for adversaries to launch an attack so as to get the reading exactly at this point or exactly at, at this point. So all in all, this is the weakest attack detection scheme. Okay, this is the weakest attack detection scheme because you're, all you are looking for is a change in the support of distribution. That's all you are looking for in this attack detection scheme. In the hypothesis testing schemes, you are looking for a change in distribution itself. So even if the support, are, support is the same, but if the distribution itself has changed, your hypothesis test will raise an alarm that the distribution has changed. And then dynamic watermarking scheme is the most powerful scheme. Of course, it takes much longer to detect an attack, but it's the most powerful scheme because if there is a persistent attacker in the system, it will be able to detect the attacker, no matter how he's, he or she is spoofing the, the uh, sensor readings. Okay, it doesn't matter. The dynamic watermarking will always be able to detect the attack. It's going to take a long time to detect, but it can detect the attack. Okay, so let me put the closing statement. So PCA, weakest hypothesis testing, weak. So this is weakest, checks for change in support. checks for change in distribution and then dynamic watermarking is the strongest checks for uh, persistent attackers. Okay, so that's the difference between the three schemes, three attack detection schemes that we have talked about so far. <clears throat> you have implemented hypothesis testing already in your assignment one. You have implemented dynamic watermarking in assignment two. You haven't implemented PCA, but I hope that you know, it's not that difficult to implement PCA for attack detection. And then, that's all. That's all I have for attack detection scheme. Now in the next class onwards, we are going to talk about response schemes, which is, now that you have detected an attack, how do you come up with a response for countering the attack? So attack is affecting the performance of the system, and you as a controller wants to react in a way so that even though the performance is going to be bad, it's not going to blow up the system, okay? That's your goal, not to blow up the system. So you want a graceful degradation, not a uh, disaster in your response. 
Now the problem with response is in general, so this is a general problem with response mechanism. For detection, most of the algorithms that we have studied, we don't really care about what kind of attacker, what, what is exactly the attacker doing. It really doesn't really matter because the detection scheme will be able to detect the attacker's presence. The problem with response is you need to specify how exactly is the attacker affecting the system. So you have to have that knowledge that the attacker is dropping the signal, the attacker is affecting your temperature sensors in a particular way, and only then you can design a response scheme because now you know exactly what the attacker is trying to do. So for the response scheme, the way we are going to do is we will have a control system problem and then we will have a attacker attack model and then we will design a response scheme for that particular attack model. Okay, and we will go through several attack models and design response schemes for those attack models. Okay, so that's what we are going to study from Friday onwards. Thank you.